Blood Drinker by James Brogdon Actaeon flees the beast through the labyrinth of dark, twisting corridors, through shaped like a man in armor that has the head like a wolf, with eyes that burn the darkness like searchlights, and a tongue that drools for the taste of his flesh. The thunder of its footsteps shake the ground, and its talons scrape the walls like its shrieking of demented souls. The only thing that stops it from seizing him immediately is the sheer size. It must bludgeon and tear its way through the narrow passages, bent into a feral crouch, its shaggy head cocked sideways against the ceiling, while he slips through a narrow space ahead of it, falling, scrambling, running. It howls its elation and hunger. The beast has no interest in stalking him. It wants him to know how close it is. It is enjoying this. It's naked, weaponless. It occurs to him simply, let himself be caught and have an end to it. But he has a vague and unformed sense that denying the beast its prey is an obligation more important than his own single life. Where this obligation has come from, or to whom it is owed, he does not know. He cannot remember a time when he was not running from the beast, nor has he any sense of where he might be running to. In this endless maze of cramped passages, but this is not to say that there are not momentary respites. The labyrinth is inhabited by acolytes, the beast. They are small, weak creatures that fall easily to Action's hands. And when he paints himself with their blood, its smell momentarily disguises him. He is able to rest. But such respites never last long, for the blood soon dries and the beast catches his scent again. The hunt resumed. And who is this witness exactly? demanded prime adjacent Gila Domita. She stood regarding the holith display that showed the mile high tower of the spike, which floated like a ghost of the unturned fang above the primary control altar, rotating slowly. The sepia image flickered and crawled like static but it was clear enough to make out inhabited areas in the green, towards the top. The amber of those regions in the middle reaches that had been charted but not yet deemed safe for settlement. And the red of the lower reaches, with Daijin fires, burned ceaselessly, and the crawlers made warrens and the mutantic glow. Arbiter Dinus Reven tried not to look too closely. I am nervous to see his home depicted in this fashion. With the hab halls occupying only the spike's uppermost portion, he did not like to think of the abyss of abandoned tunnels and chambers that stretched far below his feet. And he especially did not like to think about what was outside. No right-thinking person did. Better instead to distract oneself by concentrating on the job at hand. A scraper! Prime adjacent, replied. Collecting mold in the duct below the hab holes here. He pointed out a spot on the ghostly display just beneath the green zone, careful not to actually touch the image. Dominica's frown deepened. These attacks are getting uncomfortably close, she muttered. You have him in the interrogation chamber? Yes, Prime adjustant. Good. Let's go and talk to our unfortunate mold scraper. She dismissed the ghostly image with a curt prayer and strode from the imaging chapel. The stacco tack tack of her walking stick echoing in its sephiral space. She was not slowed by her limp. If anything, the injury seemed to make her faster. She had fought something from the outside and lived. It was said and the fact that the encounter had not driven her interribly insane only made Darius even more frightened of her. The same fight had killed almost half of their oppertees, and he had been recruited hurriedly in its aftermath. 
It came with the increased food ration and a sidearm, but there was no uniform except the badge of authority. A double-headed eagle with outstretched wings pinned to his tunic. The Aquila was an ancient symbol, often discovered stenciled on relics belonging to the Spike's original crew, and ventured as a sign of continuity those first brave souls who had fought the outside. He was determined to earn it, so he made sure that it was on straight and hurried after her. The scraper was a worm-pale scroll of a man named Belik, out of the hell Sturgo. His identity was the only reliable piece of information they can get off from him for however. Everything else was an incomprehensible babble, wet with snot and punctuated by shrieks and yells. It was white! Corpse white! He moaned. And fast! Bless Saint Geller if so fast! He was filthy, smeared in blood, grease, and the mold that it was his job to collect for food, that's. The only clear thing about him were the tracks down his cheeks made by his tears and the bandages that swathed him from fingertip to elbow. He had escaped, it seems, by throwing himself into a thermal vent. He stank of rotting duck slime and burned flesh, and he was shackled to the cot which he laid on. As he tried to bite out the throat of the shuriken, tended to him. Was it a crawler? Darius asked. Crawler? S slight no! This was bigger. So much bigger. The crawlers, the mobia, you know? This was all its own. And thank the Emperor, there was only one of the things. Was it man shaped then? Darius was actually aware of the prime adjustment standing quietly in the corner of the interrogation cell. His technique listening to his questions, assessing him. Her approval meant more than just professional esteem. Darius' own hab cubicle was not much bigger than this cell, and a promotion meant bigger living quarters away from the daily scuffle of scraps. Respected families might even see his improved status and introduce their daughters to him. Vedic gestured helplessly. At hands! I know that much. It tore Peter to pieces in front of me with them. Peter had been his cousin. Not that this said much, since everyone would spike with somebody's cousin to some degree. But maybe more so in Hillsturgo, where there was a high indence of all of births. You know, when a hydro duck breaks, Philip continued, staring at Darius with wide red eyes. The gushing sound it makes when it's spilling every which way. Darius nodded. Well, that's what I heard. Even after he'd stopped screaming, just wet sounds. Wet sounds, you know? He giggled. Started to scream. Wet sounds, wet sounds, wet sounds! Over and over, screaming and laughing at the same time. While tears ran down his face and his bare feet drummed bloodly footprints on the wall. Darius and the Prime Adjacent left him to his screaming. This dispute a squad, she said in the corridor outside. Investigate the scene of the attack. Ascertain whether he's telling the truth and recover any remains. Take a body back. She stopped and considered. Actually, take several. Just in case. If you see any sign of the attacker, do not engage. Do you understand? If this white beast is from outside, it is beyond you. Do not engage. Yes, ma'am, he said. He did his best to sound cold and professional, just like her. But as he left to put together his squad, his step quickened and his heart swelled. He told himself that this was with excitement and pride, and tried to ignore how badly his palm sweated.
Darius led his squad through the confusion of tunnels, galleries below hab halls. There were four of them besides himself, deputized from the civilian duties in the name of the Prime Adjustant. He had chosen mold scrapers and scavrats, those who knew something of the middle reaches. They had heard the same rumors of the white beast that tore men apart and bathed in their blood, and were none too happy about being ordered to accompany him. But the authority of his shining Aquila badge compelled them, resting a hand meaningfully on the pistol at his side might have helped too. Denied firearms, his conscripts had equipped themselves with knives and improvised weaponry, and shuffled along behind him, muttering darkly. The spike had once been a battleship, they said. There is only reference point such a concept was the bedtime stories told to him as a child. In the elaborate illuminated panels of the great chapel that told the story of Spike's deliverance from the horrors of the outside by blessed Saint Geller. It was clear that due to some calamity in the long-forgotten past, a cross had become down. And so any attempt to travel from one place to another involved negotiating old corridors and hallways. There were now precarious shafts, some of which dropped all the way to the Dijon fires of the spike's uttermost dips. They were crossed by catwalks and rope bridges, gangplanks and girders. And up from the light this deep came strange cries. Thuds of machinery, poisonous glows, and gust of foul air strong enough to send a man plummeting to his death. One of the scrapers, a squinting man called Surin, led them to where Velik had been working at the time of the attack. A clot of tunnels and ducts were a peculiar combination of heat and condensation allowed thick mats of algae to grow on every surface. They could see where patches of it had been scraped away with large spatulas. And the half-shacks lay abandoned. Not all the fungal growths in Spike's bowels were edible. Some secreted acid strong enough to dissolve flesh in seconds. Others were the nest for foot-long, blind centipedes that wielded poisonous stingers. Still, although produced hallucinogenic and psychonetic compounds that were in much demand by citizens of the Spike, who wished to alleviate the tedium of existence. And there was some muttering in the squad that it was more than likely Velik had murdered his partner under the influence and sought to blame the crime on an imaginary friend. Then they found Peter, or what was left of him. He had been torn apart and eviscerated so thoroughly, limbs and internal organs strewn and glistening, that it looked more like he had simply exploded from the inside. It seemed impossible that a human being could have wrought so much damage on another, even while affected by mind-altering spores. Darius swallowed thickly to prevent the contents of his own stomach joining the mass. It's done. Maga. A collect up. That. Um. He ordered. Use the spatulas. Brack, fisting, you're with me. Brack was the big lad who didn't have enough imagination to question orders. But Fistin narrowed his eyes suspiciously. Why? Where are we going? He was a scrubber. Lean where Brack was thick. Built for crawling through larger ducks with a mop and cleaning out blockades. He had come armed with one on his tools. A viscous-looking billhook at the end of a telescopic pole. We, announced Darius, with what he hoped was a look of grim resolution, are going to track this beast to its lair and kill it. All four of them looked at him. You what? said Fistine. Darius drew his sidearms and assumed an impressive stance. Listen, he said. You might be content with crawling around stinking tunnels like rats for the rest of our lives, but there's a chance here to make your mark and improve your lot. 
when we take its head back to the Prime Adjustant, we'll all be rewarded handsomely. Fistin pointed with his billhook at the mess on the floor and up the walls. You do see this, don't you? Behind them. And slopping noises and the other two men clearing up Peter's remains were very clear. Wet sounds. Dare swallowed. What I see are the remains of an unarmed and untrained civilian. What I also see, he continued, lowering his voice to sound as threatening as he could manage, is a lowly pipe scrabbler dangerously close to getting a bullet in the head for insubordination. Fisting backed up, hands in the air. All right, Chief, all right. No need for that. I was only asking. The attacker's trail was no difficult to follow. It had left not a glory footstep, but also smears on the walls and ceilings, as if it had so little fear of detection that it hadn't even tried to hide its tracks. Darius, Brack, and Fistin almost lost it at the crossing of a shaft. There were no traces on the other side, and Breck only spotted it by accident while standing in the middle of the creaking catwalk and looking up. Where the shaft continued upward into the ceiling, crude metal staples had been riveted to the inside to provide hand and foothold, and one of them was smeared with the rust brown of dry blood. Darius felt his bowels run cold. Every level higher took the creature closer to the hab holds. Up you go, then. He ordered Fistine. Fistine backed away, shaking his head, his eyes wide and white with fear. No chance, he protested. Up there, with that thing skulking about, you're out of your mind. Dearest tapped his badge with his pistol. Do I have to remind you of the consequences for disobeying a direct order? Fistine uttered a high-pitched laugh. A bullet in the head? He set his jaw grimly and tapped himself between the eyes. Go on then, sir, if it's a chance between that and what's happened to Peter. Well, at least it'll be quick. Oh, I don't mean to kill you, Darius growled. Just leave you bleeding enough to attract a bee so I can ambush it. But if that's your choice... There was a slithering, thumping sound in the shaft above them. Both men looked up. It was just inside the opening, hanging upside down, its face nearly level with their own. Humanoid or close enough, but caked with the crumbling rust brown of old blood. It bared its teeth in a grotesque parody of a smile, and Darius noticed that its canines were practically sharp and pointed. Its mask caked further, and little brown flakes drifted into their upturned faces. They screamed, and it dropped between them, twisting in mid-air with preternatural agility to land crouched on its feet, then rose to its full height, towering over them. Festin brought his billock down in a short, hard sweep, but it was plucked from his grip and brought down on his head, cleaving his skull down to the chin. He stood for a moment, spasming until his body received the message that it was dead and collapsed. Then Brack charged, swinging his thick arm, his roar turning to a scream punctuated by the pistol crack of breaking bone as that arm was gripped and twisted by giant hands, bent in impossible directions, snapping white bone shard pieces in the skin. The creature flung him over the catwalk into the abyss below, but by that time Darius was halfway back to the others, screaming for them to run. He ran to the last corner and saw that Saturn and Mugger had actually drawn their blades when something hit him from behind hard enough to throw him through the air into them, only narrowing avoiding their impalement. Being impaled. Then the ochre and bone monstrosity was among them. In contrast to the flailing and screaming of the spikers, it fought in icy silence, naked, with almost balic grace. Balletic grace. It dodged a wild swing from Mega's blade and kicked his legs out from underneath him, 
Then, as Darius tried to aim his gun with trembling fingers, it pulled Sean's head back and bit into his throat, its fang shredding its carted artery. Blood geysered over the ceiling, and Saturn stumbled away, gurgling and juttering, making more wet noise of his own. The attacker pirouetted back to Megat, grasping his face with one huge hand, raising him into the air and slamming the back of his skull into a projecting spur of metal with a crunch, so that he hung there, several feet off the floor, legs kicking like a marionette. While he was pinned, the creature plunged its hands into Maggot's belly and pulled out a fistful of purple-gray viscera. Darius managed to get off one wild shot before it turned and reached for him. It stopped. Its red-dripping fingers flinched away as if burned. The creature fell back a step. Darius saw now that it was in fact a human being. A man. Impossibly tall and real thin as if starved. And that beneath the flickering coat of old blood, his pale flesh was tattooed with arcane symbols. His face was gaunt with a broad blade of a nose and eyes that burned beneath lowering bowels, and they seemed more confused now than ferocious, and his thin lips withered like worms as if he were trying to say something. The man leapt. He was gone. Actaeon flees the beast, though it is closer now. Multiple eyes in the black carapace burn in the dark like searchlights, seeking him. And its mocking laughter echo in the covenant space of the world. Despite f for the blood of its acolytes to disguise himself, he dispatches more of them easily. All except for one. It bears a sigil that he knows, thinks he recognizes, some half-forgotten nightmare. The sigil burns so brightly that it is painful to look at, and he knows that if he touches it, it will burn him, as no fire has ever burnt flesh. It will sear its wing-shaped scar into him and force him to remember. Something of what he was. He awoke curled in a fetal position, cramped in some narrow space, he realized that he could see the angular shadows of the walls and the dim red glow that seeped up from the shaft in the floor nearby. Sighing. Singing. There had been singing. No, not just now, but earlier. Awakening him from a deeper sleep. One so deep that it might have been in depth. There was no singing now, just the whisper and hum of the derelict around him the syncopated thud of his twin hearts. Yon spirit Tiberius, remember? He told himself, but he could not remember what it was, because his thoughts kept sliding away, buried beneath the reek of blood that surrounded and permeated him. He raised a hand to his face and saw that his fingers were caked with it, tatters of flesh beneath his cracked fingernails. Emperor, save me, he whispered, appalled. What have I done? Put his fingers to his mouth and sucked them. The heavy salt copper taste of blood. Protect him from the beast, but he has been here too long. Already he can hear it approaching, thundering, shrieking, laughing. So he climbs out of his hiding place and does the only thing he knows. He runs. Well, that was enlightening, said a voice, cool and amused. Darius jerked awake with a cry. He hadn't been asleep, just catatonic. Sitting and staring for an unguessable time at the arbiter carnage in front of him. He stared around wildly, but couldn't see the speaker. Is... is anybody there? He ventured. 
He's repelled by the Aquila. The voice continued as if he hadn't spoken. It seemed to be that of a woman. He obviously recognizes it, which suggests that there is something love him left. He is more than just an animal. Enough left to reach, though. That's the question. Darius jumped to his feet, waving his pistol at the shadows. Who's there? He shouted. Show yourself! By the authority of the Prime Adjustin, I command it! Oh, well, if Dominica commands it, who am I to refuse? The voice replied. A part of the shadows unfolded itself, and a young woman was standing there. She was unarmed, dressed in ordinary vat worker's coverall, and appeared fairly unremarkable except for a fuzz of blue hair shaved close to the scalp. She was leaning against the wall with her arms crossed regarding him and his trembling pistol without the least sign of trepidation. Who are you? Dares demanded. Of what hall? What are you doing here? She ticked off on her fingers as she replied. Mm, you may call me Raid. I am of no hall, and I am going to help you defeat the creature that is killing your people. He snorted in disbelief. Already his mind was telling itself that she couldn't simply have appeared like that. She must have stepped stealthily out of the darkness without him noticing. You're lying. How can you be of no hall? And how can you possibly be of any use against that thing? Why, you're... He waved his gun at her. You're nothing but... And she changed, just for a fraction of an eye blink too quickly for him to be sure that he'd really seen it, but enough to make him reel back with shock. It was a suggestion of mismatched eyes and withered limbs, flesh naked in the tunnel's humidity, but contorted and twisted like metal tallow. Raid watched his reaction. She hadn't changed position. You're a crawler! He gasped. And you're an idiot, she observed. But maybe... If we could be of some use to each other for all that. It was unthinkable. Crawlers were only slightly less apparent than the demons of the outside. Most were descendants of the Spike's original underclass, warped and mutated by proximity to the Daijin fires. Their abnormalities magnified by the generations of inbreeding. It was rumored that some had even psycho powers. That in itself would not be a problem. The crawlers could be shot in the lower reaches and left to themselves. The numbers kept under control by periodic cleansing raids. But the periodic influence of outside sought to infiltrate the womb of every human mother from the humblest vat worker to the daughters of the high-born. All lived in fear of giving birth to a crawler and no birth was acknowledged, nor infant named, until the Shirigan brother had decreed that it was pure in the image of the emperor. For the slightest taint, be it so much as an extra little toe, the newborn would be abandoned in the lower reaches to either perish or be taken in by its monstrous kin. Such was the prime adjustant's favor for purity. Darius had no idea whether Raiden was the result of such a misbirth or the descendant of deviants. And he didn't want to know. Begone, foul thing! He spat. Back to the pit that spawned you, and take your illusions with you. She nodded calmly, but not in agreement. More like his response had been inherently predictable. Well, you'll do what? She replied. Go back to Dominica and tell her how you got your squad killed and let your quarry escape. I confess that I don't know too much about how you arbiters work, but I can imagine her promoting you after that. He found that he couldn't answer that. Or, she continued, you can go back as a hero having single-handedly defeated a blood-drinking beast. I'll let you think about it. For a while, while you stand there and look at... She prodded something that glistened readily at her bare foot. Who is this again? Reluctantly, Darius lowered his gun. 
How can you possibly help me? And what is it that you want in return? Not here, she replied, looking around. It's gone. We're still too close. There's something you need to see first. Come on. She turned to go, but he hesitated. And she turned back. I promise that you won't end up being roasted on a spit, if that helps. Not really, he muttered, but he followed her all the same. Raid led him along twisting passages, ways, and through echoing chambers across bridges that spanned churning depths and through narrow gaps where they had to squirm on their bellies like worms. They climbed canted staircases and picked their way down scree slopes of rusting wreckage, edging their way around the walls of the cathedral-like space, where the colossal hulks of machines lay tumbled atop each other like prehistoric beasts locked together in death. Darius lost any sense of time or direction long before that. All he knew was that she was leading him steadily, exorably downward into the lower reaches where nobody except crawlers and the most foolhardily of scavengers dared to go. Eventually, she stopped. We're here. We're here, she whispered. Where? he asked. Where I found him. Where I woke him up. They entered a wide, lopsided chamber through its narrowest and lowest end. And Darius gazed in awe at the sight of a huge pipe-like duck stretching up away from him, each itself as large as any one of the tunnels that Reed had led him along. Far beyond the reach of its meager torch, his spirit quailed as the thought of having to scale them. But fortunately, the object of her interest was much closer at hand, laying on the sloping floor. I couldn't feel his mind until I was almost right on top of him, she said. He was so weak, not even dreaming. Seeing in the silhouette, his first thought was that it was another body. But quickly, he saw that the outline was too rough, more like a statue of a man or a crudely carved sarcophagus. Its features nothing more than lumps and indentations, Legs fused together, arms fused to the torso. Closer still, Darius realized that his torchlight was shining through it in mottled shades of ochre, amber, and a red so deep it was almost black. And that what he had taken for solid plastil or resin was in fact a hollow shell of something like scab tissue, gnarled and knotted. The split opened from brow to groin. The edges of the splits were curled outwards, as if it had been peeled open. Something had emerged from this chrysalis. This was keeping him alive, Reed whispered. I cannot imagine how. He must have been here since the first days of the spike. A dozen generations. Who knows? Down here all the time. Sleeping, waiting to be awakened. She traced the cocoons, world counters with her fingertips. But who is he? What is he? He's a space marine, she replied simply. Deus laughed. He couldn't help it. As if she had told him that it was a blessed Saint Geller himself. Come down from his seat at the Emperor's right hand. Darius had only ever seen the Adeptus Astartes in the Glassic of the Great Chapel, winged and angelic beings that blessed righteous fire from their hands as they drove back the seething hordes of the outside. He could not quote those bright burning projectors with the ravening gorse licking wreath that had torn apart his crew, and he told her so. She regarded him coldly. I have seen him she said. I saw him laying here in the deathly sleep. I saw the interest in his flesh where he was made stronger than mortal men. I saw the marks on his skin. He has an Achilla, just like your arbiter's badge, tattooed across here. She drew a line across the top of her chest from one shoulder to the other. 
It is a symbol of his fealty to the brothers of the Emperor. You can't possibly know that, he objected. Now it's her turn to laugh. Oh, you'd be surprised at things I know. We crawlers, as you call us, do not have tech priests or adepts, but those of us who have such gifts as I do pass on our knowledge just the same. The individual that walk up in this cocoon, while his body might have survived more or less intact, his mind was essentially damaged. I've been tracking him since he woke. And when it has been safe to get close enough, I've been able to glimpse at what was left of it in his mind. He is trapped in a state of waking nightmare, believing that he is persecuted by a great beast, that the only way he can hide from it is to consume and cover himself with the blood of its servants. In this delirium, he sees your people as those servants, which is why he has been killing you. The only way to stop him is to free him from his nightmare. And just how do you propose to do that? Put simply, you're going to tell him to wake up. Darius snorted humorously and turned to leave. You have brought me all this way to mock me. Something assured his movement. He looked down at his legs, willing to move, to carry him far from this madness, but they refused his command. Instead, he found himself turning around to face her, as if he were a puppet. He could not even strain against her control, since the muscles required to do so no longer obeyed him. She had dropped her illusionary form, and he gasped at the horror of her. She was pointing at him with something that was more of a claw than a hand. The eldritch symbols swarm in the air like haze around her outstretched fingers. Her lopsided face twisted in a grotesque parody of a smile, and she slided closer, her proximity making his skin crawl. She touched the Aquila badge pinned to his chest. You recognize this, she said, and I realized that there was no way that the ruin of her throat could form the intelligible sounds. He was hearing her voice directly inside his head. It's the only possible explanation for why you are still alive. I believe there is enough. Astartes left in him to respond to its authority. Possibly he is repelled by it because on some level he recognizes how far he has fallen from the nobility of his duty. We can use that. You can use that to command him. C command him? He echoed, appalled. It seemed that she had left him control over his voice, at least. Command him to do what? To stand in his nightmare and face the beast. It does some part of him that he fears greatly. I don't understand it fully, but if he runs from it, he is a coward. Nothing more than a beast himself. In the thrall of his own terrors and appetites, he must be reminded that he is more than that. I believe he will obey you because of the symbol that you bear. But I'm no Astartes, he blurted, alarmed at the direction her thoughts were taking. You'll take one look at me and tear me to bloody shreds. Ah, but in the delirium he won't see the rich that you really are. He'll see a towering figure of authority that he'll be compelled to obey. Because of your... Gifts. Yeah. In that case, why don't you just create an illusion of the whole thing? Why do you need me at all? Because it doesn't work like that. You can't make something from nothing. There has to be a basis in reality. Framework. Something for my gifts to... To... She struggled for words, having never been forced to explain such things before. Twist, he suggests. Pervert! Raid glared at him. Have a care, Arbiter, she said. If you decide to make yourself useless to me, there are many provisions I can visit upon you instead. Darius raised his chin defiantly. 
You are an abomination against nature, an affront to every standard of decency and normality, he said. He stilled himself for her relation, but to his surprise found that he could move. She had released him, but when he looked up again, shock and surprise froze him almost as effectively as he saw that she was neither the blue-haired girl nor the scrambling mutant. She was Prima Justin Dominica. What is your duty, Arbiter? She snapped. He wavered, stammering. A small part of his mind knew it could not really be Dominica. But it was getting smaller by the second, squeezed by the unrelenting pressure of her psychic powers. And in turn something came bubbling up from deep inside him. Some animal compulsion to his base, her superior. And now that he looked again, he saw that the course must be Dominica. She must have followed him down here. Of course she wouldn't have abandoned him. But a great surge of gratitude mixed with shame at the object way in which he had failed her trust in him. She took a step closer, drew a side arm and pointed at his face. Your duty! He stared into the tunnel of the gun's barrel and swallowed. To... to protect the spike. I'm sorry that I... Her eyes were as cold, as sharp as drew bits. You will address me as Prima Justin, boy, or I will paint the wall with your sorry excuse for a brain. Please, uh, let me expl- She thumbed her hammer back. Sir, yes, sir. He squawked. Prima Justin, sir. She lowered the gun frantically. Better. And the tools that are of use, are they distractionary? I am permitted to pick and choose or decline in order to fill your duty because you feel it to be an abandonment of your front. No, of course not, sir. He added hastily. Correct. Now kneel. I... I don't under... Kneel! She roared in a voice that echoed around the chamber. She needed no psycho powers to control his legs this time. They unhinged themselves in their own accord and dropped him to the floor before her. She changed back into the blue-haired girl and smiled down at him sweetly. See, she said, that wasn't so difficult, was it? The beast is so close that Actaeon can smell the carrion stench of its breath. At times he can see on the walls the shadows of its massive wolf's head, teeth curving like daggers, and the claws on its right hand, each longing, longer than his arm. The blood of its acolytes is becoming less effective each time the beast catches up with him a little more quickly and gets a little closer. Its bubbling howl now seems to form words. Come to me, son of blood. Give yourself to me. He has no breath to spare for reply. He just runs. Then he hears the singing. It is wordless and ethereal, trickling distinctly like a sip of cool water in the tunnel's foetid heat. It is the same singing that awoke him to this nightmare. He remembers tearing himself out of some constraining space in order to find the owner of the voice, and instead finding himself pursued by the beast. After a moment's consideration, he changed directions. He does not know whether the song will bring him salvation or damnation, only that it represents the possibility of something different. He is coming, said Braid. He responds to my call. Are you ready? Do I have a choice? Darius replied. He had watched the preparations for her ritual with deepening dread in his sense that not only was he in a way over his head, but also that he might never resurface. She had found a large chamber with only one entrance, and while he cleared the floor of debris, she had gone around the wall painting symbols at certain points using her own blood. She opened a long, shallow cut on the side of her twisted thigh, and now that he looked closer without being actively repelled, he saw that much of her body was crisscrossed with old scars. When she approached him with the knife, he shrank back. 
she was undisguised. In sight of her shuffling lopsidedly towards him with the blade was unnerving. It seemed to be made of bone, for one thing. The ritual requires your blood too, she said. Why? Because you're a participant, obviously. Surely there must be some other way. She cocked her head to one side again, in a way which suggested he was being more stupid than normal. Tell me then, she said. Given our limited resources, what alternate to sanguinary vector you think would suffice to establish the primary Semitic nexus for the ritual? Uh, I... Exactly. Shut up and give me your arm. He rolled up his sleeve and drew the cut along the back of his forearm. Pain was quick and bright. She dipped her fingertips in the red that wailed from him and used it to extend elaborate on the sigils. She had already drawn. It seemed to dance in the air just above the surface of the wall in a way that hurt his eyes and lingered behind his lids even after he closed them so that, before long, he felt a headache beginning to build. She connected the sigils on the walls with lines that ran down to the floor to the central circle. At the four cardinal points, of which she piled crushed fragments of the creature's cocoon, and then she set light to them. They burned fitfully, much sputtering and crackling. The stench of it was somewhere between scorched hair and animal fat. It made his head swim with even worse than before. And all the while she sang under her breath, a wordless wandering tune that insinuated itself into his ears, the same way her symbols made his eyes blur. The only thing that stopped him from bolting back towards the safety and sanity of the upper reaches was a fear of how he was going to explain any of it to a prime adjustant. Instead, he did what he was told. He positioned himself between Raid and the entrance, with his badge held in front of him like a ridiculously tiny shield. I have to say, he ventured, I don't look much like a commanding figure of authority. You will, she muttered. He'll be fast, but he'll stop when he sees the Aquila. As before, in that moment, when the shock of seeing it causes him to lower his guard, I will be able to reach his defenses and find out what I need in order to create the illusion. You understand that this will be a reciprocal experience here. Yeah. He stared at her. She sighed. We'll be sharing this nightmare. He will see you as I intend him to, but you'll also see the beast that pursues him. But it's not real, is it? It's real to him. He stared around her, alarmed. But what does that... Then... There was a horrific squeal of tortured metal as a blood crazed Astartes ripped his way up through the floor, right into the middle of Rain's protective circle. Regardless of what Actaeon can or cannot remember, the warrior's instincts ingrained into the deepest levels of his psyche recognized the song possibility of an ambush, ruling out the direct approach along the passage. Fundamentally, the beast's labyrinth has many weak spots, doors, grills, flimsy partitions, and it is easy enough for Oction to navigate his way underneath the source of the singing, even while evading his pursuer. Son of Sanguinius, it roars, there is no escape. You will give yourself to me, as did your sire. The name is familiar. It jolts something deep in his mind, but he can't allow that to distract him because the beast is almost upon him. Just around the last corner, closer than it has ever come. So he pulls the plasteel panel of the ceiling, peeling it off like a scab and tossing it aside, and hurls himself into the cavity above. Sanguinius. It was all he'd needed. 
as if the name were an open slit gate. The truth of him spilled into her, but despite her elation, she quickly realized how badly she had miscalculated, because a lot of it was not him at all. Somehow in a manner that defiled her comprehension, what he was seeing had been played out before. The beast was not a random fabrication of his crippled mind. It was some deep terror given shape from an ancient memory. It was something ancestral, as a part of him as the blood in his veins, and so ancient that it reeked of the carnal pits of the universe. The merest glimpse of it made her want to run and hide and weep and wait for death like some small, burying animal. It had been a name. Horus. The floor erupted, and the screaming began. Darius! shouted Raid. Now! He spun towards the sound and saw two long, bone-pale arms emerge from a hole in the floor, planting hands either side, and the space ring sprung into the chamber. It bared its long, blood-stained teeth and glanced around in quick movements. Darius could see that its points along its limbs and up its torso. Black modules erupted, though he had no idea whether this was by design or the result of some disguise. And its skin was heavily tattooed. Many of the images made no sense to him, but Raid had been right that there was an aquila stitched wide across its back, like an angel's wings. And in the middle of his chest was echoed by the winged chalice, overflowing with blood. For Gellus' sake, say something! she screamed. Darius opened his mouth. Ection had expected many kinds of ambush, but the singer and the language of the beast seemed most likely. The last thing he expected to find in this chamber is a towering figure in crimson power armor, embezzled with the insignia of a salt squad sergeant. They are his own colors. They are his own colors. And seeing them reminds him of how far he had fallen. He collapses to his knees. Get up, commands the armored figure, its amplified voice booming. Would you crawl on your belly like a worm? What are you? He cannot answer this. All he can do is grovel at its feet. But the Horus beast has entered the chamber below, seeing where he has gone, and knowing its prey to be within reach at last. It howls its triumph. Up through the hole reaches its massive lightning claw, each arm long talon etched with arctic singles and crackling with ruinous energy, with which it hacks the hole wider so that it can climb up after him. The Red Sergeant grabs his arm with one huge gauntlet fist and drags him to his feet. With the other... It presses thing into his hand, the Aquila, the size of a short sword. Its edge is sharpened to a razor keenness. Take it, he is ordered. Do your duty to the Emperor and face his enemy, or else cut your own throat and be done. He takes the weapon, appalled at how puny it is in comparison to the leviathan that is birthing itself on the floor on a scream of claws and steel. Yes, he hears it croon. Run, son of Sanguinius, flee like the coward you are. It seems to him now that he is not in this dark and cramped space, but on the bridge of a colossal battle barge. Surrounded by fire and broken bodies of his brothers, this screams mingling in the gleeful shrieks of the writhing hordes of warp spawn that breast him. He is not naked, but armored in gold, and a makeshift dagger is the blade of Encarmine. Great ruby in its crosspiece burning with energies for blood. This is a memory, understands, but not one of his. He, Sanguinius, 
He has always been fighting this battle. Knowing that he's doomed, but bound to serve his emperor. Not just the end of his life, the lies of all his progeny to follow. He turns and faces Horus. He always does. As every son of his must. The beast towers over him in its obsidian armor. Blasphemous runes crowd its surface and amber eyes set in the breastplates burn while the clawed right hand flexes. Hungry for him. The claw has tasted the blood of angels and gods. In its left hand he sees breaker, a maul taller than a man. It is the weapon that would kill him. It's always killed him. But above the beast, Gorget, where Horus Fay should be, is instead a massive wolf head, lips curled back in a snarl from teeth like simlitas. Run, blah, son of blood. It growls and the floor trembles at the thunder of its voice. This is not merely a recollection of the past event. The memory of his ancient sire's defeat might be clothing this nightmare as Actaeon's nightmare. And this is Actaeon's beast, and he realizes now that it has never wanted to catch him, simply to drive him, to make him run mightiness and terrified like an animal indiscriminately killing anyone in its path. He had thought he was fleeing its control, but had been in its thrall for just the same. The chaplain's orders had a different name for this beast. They called it the Black Rage. He knows that he cannot win this fight, but he knows that he doesn't have to. All he has to do is face it. He raises the Aquila sword and says, No! No more running! The lanterns of its eyes narrow into slits. Fool! It howls. You will feed me one way or the other. And it leaps to attack. Raid huddled in the corner where she had dragged herself and watched the battle unfold in Actaeon's mind. On the floor next to the hall through which he had climbed, his physical form lay twitching and thrashing. His fists curled and uncurled while grunts and whimpers issued from his throat. Across the far side of the chamber, Darius lay curled in a fetal ball, drooling and bleeding from the eyes. There had never been any chance that his mind could withstand the confrontation he had forced upon him. He'd taken the brunt of the psychic force, unleashed by Actaeon's crisis exactly as intended. If he survived at all, it would be worth no more intelligent than a tonal mold. He could safely and happily disregard him. One fewer of Domitius' killers. And with a pet space marine under Rian's control, maybe one day soon there would be a lot fewer of them. The uncertainty lay in the figure spasming before her. The beast might not be Horus, but it was extremely powerful for all that. The likelihood was high that when Actaeon opened his eyes again, it would be nothing but the black rage staring out of them, moving as swiftly as stealth would follow. She crept around the wall, said Darius, and took his side arm. Then she retreated to the corner behind him putting the cataconic arbiter's body between herself and the Arbites, the Astartes, which was the best she could do for cover, and trained the pistol on Actaeon's head. If he awoke as the beast, he might go for Darius first. It'd give her the opportunity for one clear shot, at least. There was no point even thinking of running, as he settled down to watch and wait. Slowly his struggles began to subside, until eventually he lay still, his naked skin slick with the sweat of his exertions. Panting in contrast, her own breath was frozen in her throat, and her finger trembled on the trigger. He opened his eyes. 
She assumed her illusionary form, just in case. His gaze found her. You sang to me. He whispered, and smiled. Nakdion no longer ran from the beast, though he heard it sometimes. Far off in the distant tunnels of the spike, roaring in hunger and frustration. Blue-haired Raid told him what he had heard was nothing more than the echoes of his nightmare. But he wasn't sure. He felt that would be a bitter reckoning one day. In the meantime, he rested with her and her kin in the narrow places, recovering his strength, his memories. She promised to help him tell the false ones from the true. And he trusted her. There he sits cross-legged on the floor of the curvous chamber, giggling. He is so far down the lower reaches that he can hear the endless churning of the Dijon fires, throbbing like the blood of his own head. He is drawing with his fingers using his own blood and shit, attempting to recreate the sigils that he saw on the armor of the beast, concentrating on them helping him to keep his mind from guttering out like a candle. They whispered to him, promising him the glory that the crawler scum had cheated him of. If only he had the strength to survive and bring them to life. He's getting better at it. His shapes become clearer. His giggles turn into barks of laughter. Because it's funny. Really to think he's been so silly. Being afraid of the outside, and the sigils he found came from much deeper inside than anybody could have possibly imagined. His laughter turns to shrieks as slowly, seeing air above his scrawlings. Something starts to take shape. Yeah, mm, hmm, yeah, yeah, um, hmm, hmm, I don't really know what to say about that, that was, that was a story, yeah, it was a thing, um, I don't know if I liked it or not. I, I'm, not I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was a... Yeah, that was definitely a, a, a story. Uh, it had a good... It had a good premise. It had something going for it. I mean, if they didn't just straight up tell us, Oh yeah, it's a space marine. I think it would have been better to not know who it was or what it was and instead just be a like clues like hard clues to drive you to think is that a space marine is it and then maybe she could have been like a gene stealer or something you know and the fact that the, it, it's a ship and they're talking about Lord Geller because of the Geller field you know it was a ship once, and now it's there. And there's gene stealers, and then there was a blood angel. So it it's it's a blood angel ship that is just stuck there in space, and they've been there for generations. It, it had a cool idea. It's just it didn't really work for me. I'm sorry. It was a cool story. And I like seeing Blood Angels actually in something, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't. I don't particularly like it. I don't think it was a good story. Sorry to say, but it had good moments and it had a good idea to it, but it didn't really 
you know, go full throttle with it. And it kind of held back too hard, and it, it was holding your hand, trying to tell you, you know, look this way, this, this, that, this thing has actually a space marine. See, it has two hearts. Like, oh my god, that just killed it right there for me. That moment where it's just, oh, she's she, just a, a random, cool and sly lady with blue hair that is shaved slightly. Oh my god. That was the second part that just killed the story for me. It's just, oh, it's a it's self-insert character. Cool. Yay. Uh, oh, God. Let's see how the story goes now. I can't believe this is not, like, fan fiction. This is actually a GW book. A Black Library <laughs> book. <laughs> Shoot, I could write something better. <laughs> uh, but that is just my thoughts and opinions on this. Um, tell me what yours are in the comment section down below. What did you think of the story? And... Well, what part of the story kind of killed it for you besides... Uh, you can't just put, oh, your narration sucks, because that, that, that's, I, my, it kind of did a little bit. I wasn't, I'm not a professional 100% at this. I mean, I don't have a whole entire professional booth. I don't have directors. I don't have an acting coach. I don't have, like, years of experience. I have, like, maybe two years of experience, but that's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> Yeah, just the story itself. Where did the story just immediately die for you? And where do you think they could have gone with the story instead? Because this is supposed to be a horror story. This is this is horror. And that is an easy thing to do for 40k. Like I said, if they never told us it was a space marine of the blood angels if if instead they just left it as a mad crazed bloodthirsty killer that seemed unstoppable and they gave you hints of its outer body where in a small glimpse with a flashlight flickering on its body you can see ports on its skin and something black covering its rib cage before it darted back into the darkness. If they did that instead. You know like alluded to what it could be. And then finally after killing it. Then. Do you get the realization that. It was a blood angel. Leave that at the very very end when it dies. You know that, that's what I would have done. With the story but. Again. It's not my story. I didn't write it. It's an official story. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, before I dawdle on with any more of this stuff, let us say thank you to ongoing Patreon supporters. Let us say thank you to Cesar E. Lopez, Jamin Davidson, Ricky Brown, Matas, James Sikros, Azuth89, Thompson, uh, Thompson, 239, Starboard, Lilac NPC, Ken S., Mike Hunt For the Zunam Eldrick Maldred DJ PE and Ko Koa Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon support member of the channel, you can too in the link in the description down below. If you want to see like upcoming stories and other things that I'm working on in the background that I will not be sharing on YouTube for a while. Because on Patreon, you get the first chance to see all this cool stuff before anyone else. Well, there you go. I'll be posting more art, um, behind the scenes, bloopers, um, so on and so forth on the Patreon. So go there if you want to see more of that. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you. Thank you for listening to another one of these videos. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever time period it is you're listening to it. Hopefully you have a good day at work. 
Have a good day, or good night, whatever it may be. Sorry if I yelled in some of these parts, but that is just how some of the characters are, so... Good night to you, good sir, ma'am. And... we we'll see you in the next one. Stay safe out there and have yourselves a good one. Goodbye.